Hall, and this is a really good time to be doing this interview because yesterday I got from my publisher Putnam the page proofs for the uh, Teddy Fay thriller that I wrote with Stuart Woods. I do a series of those. And that is a bit of a milestone because when that comes out, that will be my 50th published book. I have so many backgrounds as an author. I come from a, a series of failed jobs. My first book was written somewhat by accident. What happened was I was called for jury duty. And the, it was so boring being there that the second day I brought a notebook and started scribbling in it. And two weeks later, when the case was over, I was four chapters into this. Um, I had no idea what I was writing. I didn't have a plot or anything. But uh, I was just running dialogue, and it became my first novel, Detective. Now, what it was based on, though I didn't know it when I started it, at the time I was working as a private investigator in New York City. I did it the same way that actors uh, drive taxis and wait tables. And I was working for uh, a claims investigation bureau that serviced negligence lawyers. And uh, what they would do is, these are the lawyers, back then lawyers had just been allowed to advertise. And the lawyers would advertise on TV, uh, have an accident, free consultation, no fee unless recovery, we will come to your home. They wouldn't. They would send me. And I would come in in a suit and tie, and the people assumed I was a lawyer. I wasn't. I was the investigator for the lawyer. But I would take down all the facts of their accident. They were always the same. It was somebody tripped on a crack in the sidewalk and wanted to sue the city. And I would have them sign a number of papers to get, the, uh, to get the police report, to get the hospital records, and the last thing I would have them sign would be a retainer of the attorney. And so I was posing as a lawyer, but I was a private investigator who was actually a traveling salesman. And this was my job as a private eye. And what I started writing when I was on jury duty was I took a guy doing my job and threw a murder at him because I was ill-equipped to handle it. I took the classic scene, the private eye is in his office, the guy comes in and says, you've got to help me, they're trying to kill me. And my guy says, help you? Can't help you. I don't have a gun. I've got a camera. I take pictures of cracks in the sidewalk. And a guy curses at him and runs out. He is subsequently killed. And the protagonist feels terrible about it and spends the entire rest of the novel trying to make up for the fact that he could not help this man because he was not a real private investigator. That's the book Detective. And I wrote it while I was working as a detective. And I sold it. and. It came out, the day it was published, I stopped being a private investigator. I had several sources of inspiration. Uh, the earliest was Perry Mason. My parents were both English lit teachers. And after a hard day of teaching the classics, they would come home, they would kick their feet up and whip out the latest Perry Mason paperback and read it. And I was a 10 year old kid and I found this absolutely fascinating. So I picked one up and read it, and it was wonderful. So I immediately started saving all of my money and going up and buying Perry Mason paperbacks. As a 10-year-old kid, they had really lurid covers, and the sales girls looked at me funny, but it was, I was in heaven. This was fantastic. When Gardner died, which was in 1970, uh, I... Uh, immediately started writing a Perry Mason murder mystery. And uh, I applied to uh, Earl Stanley Gardner's widow for
for permission to use the character. And she wrote back and said, you creepy kid, what makes you think you could do that? That was the first impetus was, I want to be Earl Stanley Gardner. I want to write like Earl Stanley Gardner. I want to write Perry Mason. Now, what happened later when, that, when I wasn't allowed to do that, before I wrote my first book, in the 80s, something else happened. I happened to read uh, Looking for Rachel Wallace by Robert B. Parker, a Spencer novel. And it was fantastic. It's a very simple book. He bodyguards a radical feminist. They bicker. She fires him. She's kidnapped. And he spends the rest of the book looking for her. Sounds dull. It was terrific. And I thought, wow, what a great way to write Private Eye. Um, short time after that, I saw Parker interviewed on TV, and they asked him, why do you think people like your books? And Parker said, well, uh, I think I like the way the words sound. The interviewer said, huh? He said, yeah, if the words sound good, people like reading them. And I think they like my books because they like the way the words sound. And uh, I said, well, you know, I thought, Gee, nobody reads this stuff out loud. What is he talking about? I took out Looking for Rachel Wallace again, read it again, and he was absolutely right. The words jumped off the page. There was a rhythm. There was a pace. And it just flowed. And when I started my first book, Detective, sitting there on jury duty, I had no plot. I didn't know what I was going. The only thing I cared about was I wanted it to sound good. And that was a huge influence on my writing, was the books of Robert B. Parker. In terms of giving up, quitting, I've never tried, I've never wanted to quit, but I've been quitted against. In other words, I have had publishers drop me right and left. I have found myself in a position where I don't have a job because no one will hire me. I write books that are well-reviewed, but no one reads. And after a while, the publisher finds out. The publisher says, oh my god, we're paying this guy a lot of money, and nobody's buying his books. Why are we doing that? And then they stop doing it. And then I have to reinvent myself and try again. Uh, I've done that many, many times. Uh, when they stopped buying the Stanley Hastings Private Eye novels that I write, I couldn't get a job anywhere. No one would touch me. I was poison, living death. And so I sat down with my agent and we tried to come up with something else just to keep going. Because at that point, I'd written 18 books. And I wasn't done, you know? And so we knew nobody would take a private eye. So we got as far away from that as we possibly could. We came up with, how about a little old lady who lives in a small town in Connecticut and has a nationally syndicated crossword puzzle column and solves crime on the side. Sounded good. It uh, also sounded very much like Cabot Cove, but uh, sounded good. I couldn't live with it. I had to do something to it. So the first thing that I did was I took the puzzle lady and I said, I made her a total fraud. She has this crossword puzzle column and everybody's always asking her to do crossword puzzles and she has TV ads, but she can't solve a crossword to save her life. She's a tremendous fraud and she's always having to the police are bringing her these clues and wanting them to decide. She can't do it. 
she has to get her niece, who is the actual puzzle lady, to solve them for her. So anyway, I created that character. But we still had a problem. The problem was me, Parnell Hall. People don't read Parnell Hall. So what we did was we put a woman's name on the manuscript as the author, and my agent sent it around. Bantam immediately snapped it up for more money than anyone had ever paid me. They paid this unknown woman. And the Puzzle Lady series was launched. The first Puzzle Lady book, A Clue for the Puzzle Lady, was originally going to be published with the author name Alice Hastings on it. And they were fine with that. They went along with that. They asked me for, they asked me for a bio for Alice. I wrote one. Alice Hastings was raised by English lit teachers with a fondness for Agatha Christie and the Sunday Times crossword. When not writing, Alice enjoys tennis, swimming, and co-ed softball. You know, they were happy with that. They were all set to go. Then they found out I was trying to, I was trying to line up the author photo. And they said, wait a minute. Uh, this is not going to work. And I got a phone call saying, from my agent saying, they're going to put your name on the book. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, I really think Alice would sell a lot better than I'm, I would. And they said, well, no, we don't want to make this a big joke. We don't. So they did that, which broke my heart. I wanted to be Alice Hastings. I wanted to do the whole Tootsie thing and get on TV and pull the hair off and all of that stuff. No, they wouldn't. So anyway, the, uh, the first book came out. It did very well. Developing new plot lines is never easy. I found that out early on. When I started my Stanley Hastings series, he was a guy do, working for a negligence lawyer like, like I did. And fourth book into the series, he calls on one of his clients. And they're all the same. They broke their leg. They slipped on a crack in the sidewalk. So the office girls call him, say, here, we've got a case. Go see so-and-so. Uh, and sign him up, he tripped on a crack in the sidewalk. Stanley goes there and finds the client dead. So he calls the police and they come and now they're interrogating him. And they, uh, the police say, so how did this happen? And Stanley says, well, you know, I got the phone call and they sent me here and I came up here and the guy was strangled, you know, and he, He's a black man, he has a cast on his leg, and he's lying, this is in Harlem, and I'm writing that. And suddenly I realize I have written the exact same scene in my second book in this series. This is the fourth book in this series, and I'm already totally out of ideas <laughs> and repeating myself, and I just can't, I, I don't know what I do, I mean, it is very difficult to dredge plots up, and I always face the blank page starting a new book uh, with writer's block. I always have writer's block. I have no idea where I'm going, but I say, this is my job? All right, let's start writing and see what happens. Authors have different ways of researching novels, and they'll all tell you something different. I'll tell you what I do. I don't. I write what I know as opposed to what I can learn. I, uh, I learned this early on. What, in my very first book, I had a problem because Stanley was calling on this guy who wasn't, he, he was a, an art theft, an art thief, and uh, he, uh, he had a room 
living room that was just hung with fantastic, valuable paintings. And I thought, I know nothing about art. How the hell am I going to describe this? And do I go up to Columbia? Do I call so-and-so? Do I do? And then I said to myself, wait a minute. Why am I being so pretentious? Why does Stanley have to be any smarter than I am? So I had Stanley walk in there and say, I don't know anything about art, but it looked good to me. And I'm on with the scene. I developed plot lines uh, from anything handy. And uh, for the Stanley Hastings books, uh, it usually started with a title. All of the Stanley Hastings books had one word titles. Shot, juror, detective client, uh, all the way up until the 20th book in the series. The Edgar Awards are the uh, mystery awards that are given every year that's named for Edgar Allan Poe. The Mystery Writers of America uh, give out the awards in April. There are nominative, nominations are made and the awards are announced at a banquet. It's like the Oscars. And I was nominated for my first book, which was a shock to me because I didn't know about any of this stuff. The writers that come along these days, they all know everything about it. They've all been to the voucher cons, to the left coast crime conventions. They've all been there pitching their book, getting agents, the unpublished authors, until, until they finally get published. When I got published, I mean, it just happened. It was, uh, it was a, a fluke. Uh, I didn't expect it to happen, but it did. And so when I got nominated for the Edgars, it was, wow, it happened that that year, the World Crime Congress was being held in New York in conjunction with the Edgars. So I went there uh, because I was nominated and I saw some panels with authors speaking, and um, this wide-eyed kid looking around going, oh my God, those are real authors. And I always expected someone to take me by the shoulders and say, oh no, no, uh, this is for writers, you know, and lead me. As, and uh, that feeling has followed me throughout my career. Right now, I'm sick. Right now, my career is going nowhere. Um, my career is, I just finished my fifth Stuart Woods book. And the Stuart Woods, the Teddy Faye thrillers are, uh, they're a, a funny thing for me. After a lifetime of writing books that no one read, suddenly I'm writing the Stuart Woods books and everybody reads them. They're on the New York Times bestseller list. It's amazing. And the reason they are is because on the cover of the book, I'll show you one, it says, Stuart Woods and Parnell Hall. And people buy them because his name is on them. So people buy them because they don't know I wrote them. And that's terrific because it's so nice to have people buy and actually read something you wrote. And on the New York Times bestseller list, our names are exactly the same size.